Thank you for worshiping with us. If you are um, in town, we would love for you to worship with us in person and just honor scripture by coming together as one body. There is something so special about that. And if you would like to um, give, we encourage you to give online through our website or you can use our app. Here's some more announcements. There will be a senior adult regathering dinner on Thursday, September the 8th at 6 p.m. in the fellowship hall. Food and drinks will be provided. If you'd like to sign up, see Pastor Tom by Monday, September the 7th to reserve your spot. Also, September the 7th is the last day for open registration for Awana, so be sure to sign your children up by the 7th. We hope you have a great time worshiping with us. In Philippians 2, 9 through 11, it says, Therefore God elevated him to the place of highest honor and gave him the name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Worthy of Your Name has two lines in the song that stick out to me. The King of Kings has claimed His throne, and you are worthy of Your Name. What this song brings to my attention is the reminder that Jesus lives up to His name. He fulfills it 100%. When you are in need of the I am, he fulfills the Jehovah. When you are in need of the security, he fulfills El Shaddai. He is our deliverer and rescuer. He is everything you need him to be, every role you need him to fill. He is Jesus, and he is worthy of his name. In John 4:23, when Jesus was speaking with the Samaritan woman at the well, he told her, The hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship Him. Let's worship together in spirit and truth, because Jesus is worthy of His name. Till forever 
my maker, my ransom, my savior, my refuge, my hiding place. You're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. You're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And you stand by my side, and you stood in my place, Jesus, no other name. Holy Jesus, no other name. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. You are worthy. Hey, I hope that you're having a, a great time worshiping with us at uh, First Baptist on our online uh, Sunday. And before we dive into the sermon today, I, I want to, you know, really kind of dig into something for a second that's kind of, you know, been on been on my mind as, as we're dealing with so many things and so many issues uh, related to, to the pandemic that we're, we're dealing with right now. And, you know, there's kind of some, some different, you know, groups of people that at, at First Baptist are really striving to minister to because we really understand that there are some individuals and families uh, within our local area that you know are right here around us in the Okeechobee area that you know they're dealing with some legitimate medical things that really cause them to, you know to have some um, uh, problems being able to get out right now and that's really one of the driving forces and reasons behind us wanting to expand so much of our online. You know, like there's one of our senior adult ladies who has a uh, heart issues and COPD, and she's really trying to be guarded and, and try to protect herself and make sure, you know, she, she does everything she can to make sure she doesn't, you know, pick up this virus. And then we've got on the other end of the spectrum, we've got a young family that uh, just, had a, just had a baby and it was a preemie. And so they're being, you know, very cautious. Like, I, I haven't got to go see the baby yet and won't for uh, quite some time, which is totally understandable. But as we think about that, there are a lot of us that are, you know, moving back towards a, a lot more, you know, normalcy as far as in our schedules and our routines. And so something I really want to encourage you about is, as you are doing so, to remember the importance of live church attendance. It's great to be able to use the online platforms when necessary, but you know, kind of how I've been thinking about it for my family and for myself. And Marie and I talked about this, you know. She she said it's easy for me to stay home on Sunday morning and sit in my pajamas and, and watch the service. I mean, we had a conversation about it, but she told me, she said, I I don't feel that's necessarily what I should be doing. So she's been coming to our, our legacy service at 1115 and sitting in the balcony and being a part of worship because her thought process was she was missing that in person and being there with others and the fellowship and the camaraderie that comes from that. Because the Bible's really clear about that. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it tells us to not forsake the assembling together of ourselves because we hold each other accountable in that. There is something to be said for gathering together with other Christians that encourages us to be there live. The early church, they gathered daily. 
to meet together and to, 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 to eat together, to talk, to fellowship, to study the Word. It was such a huge part of their lives. And you know, it's really, really easy for us to get real comfortable and not do that. I get it. It's, it's right there in my family that, that that same exact thought process can happen so quickly. But what I would ask you to do is just pray over that. And, and to be honest, if you're out and you're going to restaurants and you're shopping and you're doing all these normal activities again in your life that, uh, that you were doing you know, pre-pandemic, I would encourage you to do the same thing with church. To stop, to think about it, to pray over it and to make being a part of a live worship service an important part of your week. Because I believe there is so much more to be gained than just watching online. But I do understand that there are those that, with people in their families, or they themselves that have you know, a lot of underlying medical things that it's, it may not be um, prudent for them to be out right now. But if your life is kind of getting down that road, I would love to see you here in person at First Baptist at either one of our services at 9 o'clock or 11.15. Feel free and comfortable to wear a mask if you like. Uh, we are doing our very best to practice social distancing and giving people space in the worship center and in the rock to uh, make sure that everybody's not having to sit on top of each other, that there is space there. So a matter of fact, I added some new seats just uh, last week to, to give us a, a little more room where people have more seating options at The Rock. We even have an overflow room uh, set up with the service playing um, on video in there just in case our room gets a little too full. We've got an option there. So be praying over that um, with me. And remember how important it is for church attendance, that live attendance to be a part of your weekly routine to not forsake the assembling together for ourselves and to mimic and imitate what we saw that first church doing. So I hope to see you in person soon um, if your health uh, allows you to. But as we uh, jump into our sermon today, this is the last week of our sermon series in um, Psalm 119, Unshakable Foundation. And so we're going to close out this week looking at several different verses from Scripture, but mainly focusing in verse 165 of Psalm 119. The King James puts it like this. It says, Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now think all of us have days where things just don't seem to go right. Everything seems to come unhinged. We find ourselves getting irritated, right? I have those days when uh, nothing seems to be able to shake me. Whatever is thrown at me, I can shake it off. I can keep moving forward. It doesn't rattle me. And then there's some days where the slightest thing irritates the fool out of me and makes me want to just run out of the room screaming. Now, I mean, <laughs> that's how I feel. It's not how I should react, but it's how I feel. And I think all of us have that. So if we find ourselves struggling with that, we need peace. We need great peace. We need peace from God. That when we find all of these things in life hindering us and pushing our emotions around, we need to find that peace. Listen to how some other uh, translations use verse 165, how they translate it. The New International Version says, Great peace have they who love your law, and nothing can make them stumble. The New Century Version says, Those who love your teachings will have true peace, and nothing will defeat them. The New English Bible says those who love your law are completely secure. They are not upended. And finally, the New Living Translation, which is what we use so much here at First Baptist, says those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. So those who love God's law, nothing will cause them to, to stumble. Nothing will defeat them. Nothing will throw them off. Everything fits. They won't stumble around in the darkness trying to figure out what's going on because they have peace. And not just peace, they have great peace. So this is a promise, right? I mean, look at it again. Those who love your instructions have great peace and do not stumble. So there's a promise, there's a condition, and there's a result. So... Let's look at this and break it down. The first part is the promise. You have peace. 
Those who love your instructions have great peace. And that is a, an awesome concept. Now, the Hebrew word for peace is a word that a lot of people know. It's the word shalom, right? If you go to Israel and, and you're walking around, that is, a, that is a common greeting is to have someone say shalom to you. I, I, had, a, I had a youth pastor uh, at one time when I was in middle school that every time we dismissed from, from our um, Bible study time, he would have each one of us say shalom to the person next to us. And as a middle school boy, that seemed kind of weird, okay? Uh, but he was trying to instill a biblical principle in us and trying to teach us a little bit more about God. And he talked to us about what shalom meant. So shalom itself goes deeper. It's a, it's a rich idea. It involves the idea of prosperity and happiness and contentment and most importantly, a blessing from God. Uh, J. Oswald Sanders put it like this. He says, peace is not the absence of trouble, but the presence of God. So when we say shalom there, when we're talking about this great peace, it's talking about so much more than just, you know, happiness, being okay with something. There's a lot deeper meaning to it there. The presence of God in our lives. Contentment no matter what our circumstances may be. There's a lot of things happening there. And the Bible has a whole lot to say about peace. In John 14, 27, here's what Jesus said to the disciples. He says, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give, so don't be troubled or afraid. Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 5. He says, therefore, since you have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have a peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Then Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, probably the most famous passage about peace in the Bible. It says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He was done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. So we want this great peace, this great shalom from God. And if we want it, we have to learn the idea of submission. Okay, this is really important here. That if we're going to have peace, we have to submit our lives to God. And when I say submit our lives to God, what do I mean there? I mean that we're not demanding our own way, but we are saying, God, whatever you have for me, I accept. And I have peace over it. See, here's how it works. A lot of times we want to begin our day and we come up with all the things we want and we may pray about it and, and ask God to bless us in all these things. See, what we're doing is we're giving God a list of the things we want and the things we want to do that day and the way we want the day to go. And what we would like to do is we'd like for God to rubber stamp that for us. God, would you just put your stamp on that so I can move on with my day? That is not at all what God is after. See, no wonder we're frustrated and we're anxious and we're upset and we struggle so bad when things kind of tend to go sideways in our lives because we're not looking at it straight, right? We're thinking more about our will than God's will. We want God to submit to us more than we submit to Him. Right? We've got good things. God, I've got good things I want to do for you today. I've got good things I want to accomplish today. I've got good things I want to accomplish in my life over the next year. So if you would, just help me out with that, right? Let my job go well. Let my business prosper. You know, let my family do good. No illnesses now. Maybe a cold. You know, got a little one. So maybe, you know, one round of bronchitis. That's about what I can handle right now. You know, all the bills get paid. Lord, don't let the car break down or the air conditioning go out. Goodness gracious, don't let the air conditioning go out in this place. But that's not how it works. See, C.S. Lewis, who is absolutely one of my favorite Christian authors of all time, he remarked about this idea. He said there are only two prayers in the universe. My will be done and thy will be done. Everything else fits into those two categories. That's how he viewed it. See, like most people, myself, honestly, I would like to have my will be done. I've got plans, and I'd like for them to work out. I know what I want to accomplish. I know how I want it to work. And boy, have I had plans over the years. Uh, I, I, I figured by now, our church would have already broken ground on our, our new worship center. You know, we were planning to get really rolling on that back in March. 
five months ago. But here we are. And we're still working on that loan. But we're getting there on that construction loan. We, we're, we're moving in that direction. That's the time it was different than mine. Did I plan to have to socially distance everybody in church? No. Did I plan to have to take so much of our ministries online? Not at all. Even though I'm a fan, I'm a fan of online. I think I think online uh, ministries and resources and things coming from a church is a great thing. But I wouldn't plan to rely on it like this. I know there's a lot of you that are probably watching online right now that. You weren't planning on having to be caged up in your house for the last, goodness gracious, working on six months. I know that's not the case. But here we are. So instead of praying, my will be done, I need to be praying, thy will be done. Consider the example of Jesus in this. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane right before He was arrested and He was praying. And He was in such distress that that he actually was sweating blood. And that's something that can really happen. It's a, it's a real medical thing that there's so much stress on your mind and on your body that the capillaries right beneath your skin actually burst. And as you sweat through your sweat glands and the pores, out comes blood mixed with the sweat. And it looks like you're sweating blood because you partially really are. That's the level of stress Jesus had because remember, He knew the physical toll this was going to take on Him. The emotional toll, the spiritual toll. He understood He was fixing to die and He understood that He was fixing to be separated from the Father and from the Holy Spirit. He got all that. And as He was praying there in the garden in Matthew chapter 26, this is what He said. He says, My Father, if it be possible that this cup pass from Me, nevertheless, not My will, but Your will be done. That's one of the greatest prayers I think we can ever hear or think about. Not my will, but thy will be done from Christ in that moment. What a, what a will he had to submit to. What he had to do. And see, I think that truly content and happy people pray that. They pray thy will be done and they yield it to the Lord. I've had a real hard time with that on a personal level over the last several months. You know, as, as, as like I talked about with, you know, working towards our new worship center, which we desperately need at our church. You know, we are in, we are in serious need of it. Right before the pandemic hit uh, at, at Church of the Rock, we were having to put out uh, tables, new, uh, our new chairs after the service started to seat people because the place was so full. We desperately needed it. Our, our other uh, part of our, our church is, is, is an older facility and you know we really do need those upgrades for, for all of our services, all of our ministries, our children's ministries, everything. We need it. And so I've been really frustrated. I was been very, very frustrated even since we started back meeting to be patient and understanding that that you know, there's there's just there's people that don't need to be out right now, and I need to be okay with that, and and that's been hard, just honestly, because I look at God and I go, Lord, what 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 are you doing with us right now, Lord? This isn't my plan, this isn't the direction I had for our church. Not my will, but Thy will be done. And over the course of about the last, I mean, honestly, month. I've been able to kind of work through that and getting to that place of saying, okay, God, not my will, but thy will be done. Lord, I'm going to lead as best I can. I'm going to pray over things. I'm going to think about everything I say, everything we do. And Lord, I want it to be for you. And God, you'll guide us. You'll lead us. None of this was a mystery to you. And I feel like at least right now, and it may flare up on me tomorrow, but at least right now I have come to a place of being at peace and being okay with God's will in this situation. But I had to work to that point, and you're going to deal with that too. You may be dealing with that in some of the same ways that I am with what we're dealing with in our nation right now. Or maybe something totally different that you're struggling with, that you're having to find peace about because your will wasn't done, but God's will was done, and they didn't line up. God had something different for you. 
at the end of the day, it may be something better, but it's different. And, you know, we, we as adults, we're a lot like kids. There's not a lot of difference. We want what we want. We want it right then. If we don't get it, sometimes we'll pitch fit in the floor. All right? We'll roll around in the floor like a kid in Walmart who wants that toy. Nobody's going to buy them. I was there. I was that kid. I rolled around in the floor. It wasn't Walmart. It was Woolsworth, but I was there. And there's still some of that in me. And I have to fight through that. You're going to have to fight through it too. So this peace that God has given us is conditional. We had need to have this confidence in God, but it's conditional. If you want this great peace, there's a way to get it. And the Bible's real clear. It says those who love your instructions. So those who love the Word of God, those who follow the Word of God, will have this great peace. That is a very specific condition that's attached to this, this great shalom, this great peace. And it's given to those who love God's instructions. But loving God's Word, as we talked about previously in this sermon series, that's not weird, okay? Because it's talking about not a, a mushy, uh, romantic love, you know. It's, that's not what it is at all. The love that's being talked about there in the Hebrew is that commitment love of making a commitment to a person, of standing by them through thick and thin, you know, it's, it's that uh, till, till death do us part, right? For better or worse, till death do us part. It's that part of love. So God's calling us to be committed to His Word. And when we are, we'll have that peace. So when I think about the Bible that way, that concept of loving God's law takes on new meaning. We, we don't love the ink printed on the paper. It's not just the words or even the message, we are committed to and love the Word of God because who wrote it? Because God is the one that wrote it. He's the one that put, that put pen to paper at the end of the day, right? He's the one that inspired the, those men to write over the course of centuries. From Moses to John and everybody in between, be it Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel, Matthew, Paul, James, Peter... All of them, inspired by God. But at the end of the day, it's God's Word. So loving God's instructions means more than just reading the Bible or memorize certain verses. To love God's instructions means to embrace it. To embrace it as the rule of your life. That it's what you're going to do, okay? It's what you're going to be. It's going to direct your paths, that's loving God's Word. That's how you get that great peace because you have submitted to God. You were under that. And now when His will comes to pass, you're okay with it even if you see that it's not what you might have chosen because my God's got a better uh, track record of making choices than I do for sure. He's going to get it right. I'm going to get it wrong. But Christians, sometimes we tend to be ignorant of the Bible, and we need to be in the Bible. We need to be dedicated to it, loving His Word. Look, guys, pray for that. Ask God to give you a love for His Word. Pray and say, Lord, help me to, to want to be in Your Word. Help me, Lord, to want to pray. Lord, help me to want to follow Your instructions. Guys, those are prayers God desperately wants to hear and desperately wants to answer. That is part of His will. 100%. So if you're struggling with being in His Word, you're struggling with praying, you're struggling with obedience, take that to God and be real honest about it. Right, don't beat around the bush. You don't have to put flowery language into it. Just be honest. Lord, I'm having trouble concentrating when I open Your Word. Lord, I'm having trouble stopping what I'm doing and opening Your Word. Lord, I'm having trouble remembering what I read. Lord, I'm having trouble even wanting to at all. Get honest with it. God wants to hear it. Ask for it. Ask for God to help you have a commitment to love His Word. So there's the promise, there's the condition, and there's the result. It's what we get. Now, the end of the verse tells us that the result comes from the great peace is that nothing shall offend them, is what the King James says. Now, that's promise, right? That's, that's a great promise. See, you can look in the Hebrew 
and see the word nothing there in the King James. And the word that's translated there is nothing. When you go to the Hebrew, you know what it means? Nothing. It's very simple. It literally means nothing. Nothing will irritate us. Nothing will destroy our composure. Nothing will get under our skin. Nothing will make us hot and bother. Nothing will cause us to get bent out of shape or frustrated. That's quite a promise. And folks, do I need this promise? I think I need to very much try to love God's Word more. Because in my emotions, I can let myself get up into a ball of emotions sometimes. I can get upset about things. And I don't need to be like that. I feel like as, as time has gone, I've grown in that and I, I, I'm, I'm less so. But I look at my life and I honestly think about that. And I'm like, wow, I'm not there. You know, I, I still struggle with this. I still get offended. I need to work on this. Now, some of the newer translations use this, fr- this last phrase and use words related to stumble. And that's what the New Living Translation does. It says, nothing can make them stumble. So the word picture here that we have is a foundation, okay? A strong foundation in time of trouble. Nothing will offend us. Nothing will cause us to stumble. Nothing will throw us off our game. Nothing will shake us and rattle us. Boy, that's that's how we want to live life, isn't it? Wouldn't that be a great way to live life every day? Not stumbling? So it doesn't say there won't be stumbling blocks. It doesn't say there won't be issues. That's not what it says. But it says we won't stumble. See, life is filled with problems. Life is filled with difficulties. Right? The wheels are going to come off. You know, being a pastor at a church, I've just, let me tell you something I have discovered. That sometimes I cause my own problems, but the vast majority of the problems and things I deal with are not of my own making. And I look around sometimes and go, you know what? I'll mess things up myself enough. Why is everybody else messing these things up? And I'll get frustrated about it sometimes. But I don't need to. I'm going to deal with them. There's going to be stumbling blocks. But I need to have the right attitude about them, and so do you. When life throws you that curveball, don't be surprised. It's inevitable. Handle it as God would have you to. To be okay with it. to to deal with the failure, the disappointment, the sadness, sometimes the tragedy that comes. So when we read this verse, understand that there will be stumbling blocks, but they don't have to make you fall. Maybe you'll step over them. Maybe you'll walk around them. Maybe God gives you the grace to walk through them. But in any case, you won't fall. What we're doing here is arming ourselves so that the circumstances of life don't destroy us. When the sins of others affect us, when our own sins bring consequences into our lives, when the illness comes, when the problem hits, when the unexpected roadblock comes up, it won't end us. We'll still continue to be the men and women of God that He's called us to. See, if we're attacked, we won't stumble. If we're ridiculed, we won't stumble. If we struggle with temptation, we will not stumble. If we face bad circumstances and hard times, won't stumble. If we have fear and worry, we won't give in to it. If we feel unequal to the to, to what's put before us to do, we feel overwhelmed by the situation we're in, and like we can't, we don't, we don't know what to do and we can't get through it, we won't fail. If we lose a loved one, It won't be the end of us. We will not stumble. We'll continue to press forward. Because see, there's times when clouds are going to appear, when suffering is going to threaten, when bad things are going to happen. But see, that's when the Lord says, fear not. Because above all those things, above the clouds, above the storms, the sun is still, still shining. The clouds will be gone eventually. The sun will shine again. See, that's a beautiful thing to think about. But this great peace that we have if we love God's Word, if we love His instructions. When we follow Him, when we love His Word, there's peace. Nothing will cause us to stumble. Nothing will defeat us because the Word of God is our foundation. 
And when God's Word is our foundation, we are secure because while everything else may wash away, everything else may be shaken, everything else may fall apart, that never will. So what is your life built on? When you're seeking peace, when you're seeking fulfillment, what are you seeking it in? When life goes off the rails, where's your comfort found? It needs to be in God's Word. Right in the middle of that will you find peace and you will not stumble. Pray with me. Lord, we thank you for the peace that you give us. And God, for how good you are. And Lord, we do thank you, God, for the opportunity that we have to worship. Lord, both online and in person, God. Thank you for the technology that we have, the ability we have to do that, Lord. That God, even through the most difficult of times, we can still hear your word, we can still love your word, and God, you can guard us from stumbling. So Lord, bless us. And God, I pray for each one of us that we turn to you for the peace in our lives. Lord, that we don't turn to others, we don't turn to material possessions, We don't turn to money or businesses or jobs or anything else because, God, every one of those things will pass away, Lord, but you will not. God, I praise you that you're eternal. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us online today. And uh, maybe you've just found us. We'd love to connect with you. Uh, If you could, we'd love for you on our YouTube uh, video, if you're watching us via YouTube, to uh, click on the uh, description of the video and there'll be a link there. Uh, with an online response card. You can just give us some brief information about yourself. All we'd really ask is your name and either an email or cell phone number. And we'll either shoot you an email or a, uh, a text and just get in touch with you. Make sure um, you can connect with the church however you need, answer any questions you may have. Uh, maybe there's some ministries you're interested in. We'd love to give you more information about those. Connect you with small group Bible studies and different things that we may have available. We'd love to do that for you. We actually had somebody uh, watch online and uh, join the church thought it was one of the coolest things I've ever seen. So uh, we're real happy about that. So that's a really cool thing. Uh, you can do the same thing if you're watching us on Facebook. You can look there in the description and you'll find that, uh, that same link there. But we hope to see you in person real soon at our First Baptist Church. You guys stay, st- stay safe, stay healthy, be blessed.